Are you a kid of the 90s? Do you love adventure? Then you may remember a little puppet show about an imaginative tooth. Yes, it's the adventures of Timmy the Tooth. Whether or not you look back on the series fondly, fearfully, or with a general annoyance, if you grew up watching these tapes, they most likely made some sort of impact on you. As for me, I loved the show when I was a kid, and whenever I see that smiling tooth, I can't help but feel a massive wave of nostalgia roll over me. Timmy has ingrained himself into my childhood, whether I like it or not. Created by Phil Barron, who might be best known for voicing the Teddy Ruxpin dolls, The Adventures of Timmy the Tooth looks like a dental hygiene lesson on paper. However, aside from the names and theming of the characters, there's really not too much related to the proper tooth care. It's kind of like how VeggieTales doesn't really teach anything about nutrition. So, if he wasn't teaching good brushing habits, what was Timmy all about? Mostly, it was about Timmy facing a minor problem, and then having an extended fantasy or dream sequence that was based around what was going on in real life. Pretty basic kid show stuff. There are two legitimately impressive parts of the show that I still admire today. The first is the puppets. While most of the sets on the show were tacky as all hell, the puppets were actually really well-built and expressive, probably because they were all designed by Bob Fapiano, the guy who built the ALF puppet. Most likely where the budget went. The other thing I still like is the music. The songs are surprisingly well-written for a kid's show and insanely catchy. I still have trouble getting some of them out of my head. You are my friend. You're my very best friend. <laughs> my buddy and me, we are two friends for life. Otherwise, the show was, admittedly, so-so. Tim himself was sometimes annoying in his peppiness, like many hosts of kids' shows, but not to the extent of, like, Barney the Dinosaur or anything. Unlike Barney, Tim was actually allowed to show a range of emotions, other than relentless cheer. Unsurprisingly, the writing was usually rather corny and a little condescending, with the most fun moments to me as a kid going to the series' antagonists, rather than the somewhat duller heroes. Jump! I'll catch you! Okay, here I come! Okay! Ah! <laughs> I lied. <laughs> I will give credit to the puppeteers, though. They brought more emotion out of characters like a toothbrush than you'd expect. On that note, I guess I'd better take a look at the cast. Now, obviously, we have to start with Timmy the Tooth, who lived in Flossmoor Valley. He was kind of like a milder version of Pee Wee Herman sometimes. He was mentally a kid, didn't have any apparent guardians or a job, but he lived in a pretty nice house and had no real worries other than remembering to return a friend's toy he borrowed or something. Also, he and Mr. Herman shared a major bow tie passion. As I said before, unlike Barney, Timmy was allowed to get mad or upset at things, and even though he usually held his cool, he had a vulnerable side. Obviously, they weren't aiming for a major multi-layered hero here, but it was nice to give him any kind of semblance of dimensions at all. Promotional materials state that Timmy was born in the mouth of a big old brontosaurus, but this was never touched on in any way, shape, or form in the series proper. His best friend slash pet, it was a little hard to tell sometimes, was a toothbrush named Brush Brush. Yeah, the, the name's not terribly creative, but the general character idea was kind of clever. He was a dog-like brush who licked Timmy when happy and growled at villains. Instead of barking, though, he spoke, for lack of a better word, in a series of swishing whispery sounds where you could occasionally make a word or two out. While he wore a collar and was treated as a mangy pest by the bad guys, Timmy and friends saw Brush Brush as an equal, but only Timmy could consistently understand those brush noises. Timmy's friends included a bright young woman named Bubbles, the Ditsianette, Sydney, the neurotic Cyclops, and the lunk-headed but good-natured Johnny Paste, a walking toothpaste tube. There's also Miss Flossie, who was Wild West-themed. That, 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 that was her only thing. Finally, there was an elderly tooth named Mr. Wisdom, who was a mentor of sorts to Timmy, and apparently a retired wizard. According to the promotional backstory, Mr. Wisdom was the one who found Timmy in the mouth of the aforementioned Brontosaurus, but again, this was never brought up in the show. Moving on to the villains, there was the Gingivitis Gang, who dressed like mobsters, but were ultimately petty bullies whose bark was much worse than their bite. They were even seen to be on good terms with Timmy on occasion, although still not terribly often. No, the real bad guys and arguably the most memorable characters on the show were the Cavity Goon and his sidekick Miss Sweetie. Similar to Timmy's Jurassic Origins, promotional material stated that the goon was spawned from a prehistoric tar pit and found that he could rot anything he touched. That sounded like an idea that's actually pretty cool and kind of creepy, right? So, naturally, they never brought that up in the series at all either. Both characters were very well designed, with Sweetie being a giant peppermint and the cavity goon looking somewhat unhinged and golem-esque. We love adventures, precious. If the cavity goon and Sweetie were the worst things living in Flossmoor Valley, then it was probably an idyllic place to be. Occasionally, the goon would up his game a bit by trying to kidnap Timmy, or put out the entire sun to have perpetually gloomy days, but this was pretty rare. 
only 10 episodes of Timmy the Tooth were ever made. While I sincerely wish that there were more, I'll find a silver lining here because now I can do quick recaps on all of them for my video, starting with Episode 1, Timmy in Space. In our first episode, Timmy and Brush Brush are playing with their toys, many of which Timmy has borrowed from his friends and is probably a bit overdue on returning. Before heading out to give the toys back, he fantasizes about being a space commander, heading out to answer a distress call from the planet, uh, Schmengi, which sounds like a made-up Yiddish swear word or something. He is greeted by the planet's enthusiastic, seemingly only inhabitant, played by his friend Sydney. Apparently, the Cavitigoon and Sweetie lock Sydney out of the space station and are up to vaguely implied mischief or something or other. After attempts to lure them out of the space station fail, Timmy somehow manages to fashion a teleportation device that manages to get everything back in order. Aside from the, it's good to return what you borrow bit, I'm not really sure what we're supposed to learn from this one. Episode 2, Operation Secret Birthday Surprise. So, from the title alone, you probably know the gist of this one. Let's run through it real quick anyway. It's Timmy's birthday, and all his friends are busy or dismissive. Now, obviously, they're planning a surprise party, but the oblivious Timmy is dejected and wonders if he's done something wrong. Clearly, he hasn't seen one of the thousands of cartoons that have done this plot already. Timmy is summoned to Wisdom Mountain, home of the aforementioned Mr. Wisdom, as a ruse to keep him away while the party is planned. Timmy falls asleep and has a dream where he sees what the world would be like if he never came to Flossmoor Valley. So yeah, they've upped it from the cliché surprise party plot to the cliché It's a Wonderful Life spoof ripoff homage deal. While most of it involves Timmy's friends never meeting each other, leaving town, or becoming the dons of the world's tamest street gang, what really sets Timmy off is seeing that the Cavity Goon has taken up residence in his house and is using Brush Brush as a slave. Of course, Timmy wakes up, realizes his worth, and gets a surprise party, to the surprise of no one. This episode, despite being the second one, felt more like a pilot because it spent a lot of time introducing the characters and had pretty much the whole cast in it. Also, I admit, I love that one of the first shots has the Cavity Goon sleeping on a park bench under a newspaper. Is he homeless or sleeping off a sugar bender or something? Episode 3, Molar Island. Timmy has been having a rough day, which includes doing whatever the hell this is with his telephone. He falls asleep wishing for a dream vacation away from Flossmoor Valley. Of course, he gets that literal dream vacation seconds later, when he finds himself dreaming he has been dumped off on the far off Molar Island. The island's two tribes have been feuding for a long time, apparently, for no concrete reason. Things have been kicked up a notch recently, though, because the Gingivitis tribe has stolen the crown of King Cuspid, which, unbeknownst to them, is the only thing keeping Molar Island from sinking into the sea. If it's not returned to its proper place soon, the entire island will submerge. Timmy and Brush Brush take it upon themselves to steal the crown back, but are almost immediately captured by the Gingivitis tribe, who straight up plan on eating them in soup. I guess it's not technically cannibalism, but... Timmy manages to see the tribe see reason about the island's impending fate, and before you can say, they return the crown, make peace with the other tribe, and save Molar Island, that's exactly what they do, so, yeah. Episode 4, Malibu Timmy. Timmy and the gang are heading out for the beach, but Timmy is self-conscious that he can't swim. He drifts into Dreamland, this is a major recurring thing in the early episodes, and dreams that he is Malibu Timmy, the world's greatest lifeguard. Malibu Timmy takes a backseat for most of the episode after that, observing the beach's surfing contest. There's a lot of talk about practicing and good sportsmanship, of course, but it all goes south once the Cavity Goon, alias Goondoggy, arrives. He plans on winning at all costs, and I do love how brazenly he admits this to the judges when he first appears. So, Goondoggy, how do you plan to win today's contest? I plan on cheating! Hey, that doesn't sound very fair. Ha <laughs> ha! That's the idea! After his stunt of throwing an anchor at Johnny Pace that is also tied to his arm fails, I'm not entirely sure what he wants to accomplish there, Goondoggy is lost under the waves and all eyes turn to Malibu Timmy, who is suddenly a little less confident. If I'd known being a lifeguard meant guarding their lives, I would never have said yes! Despite his best efforts to save the goon, even in Timmy's dreams, he just can't escape from the harsh grip of reality. Oh, I didn't know you could swim! Timmy the Two. You're right, I can't swim. Yeah, that's what I thought. Once he awakens from his nightmare, Timmy admits his anxieties to his friends, who, of course, are accepting and willing to teach him. Episode 5, Lost My Brush. This one was my favorite as a kid, hands down. If you've noticed, almost all of the Cavity Goon's major appearances have been in dream or fantasy sequences. But here it shows that he's not just a green boogeyman who plaques, uh, plagues, haha, Timmy's dreams. No, he and Sweetie do exist, and this is the only episode that shows them actively pestering Timmy in the real world. Yes, Virginia, there is a Cavity Goon. 
Their nefarious plan this time is to kidnap Timmy and use him for some major tooth fairy money. To get to Timmy, however, they need to separate him from his faithful Brush. Meanwhile, Brush Brush wakes up early from a nap and leaves the house chasing butterflies. When Timmy freaks out upon not being able to find his best friend, he recruits all his buddies to scour Flossmore Valley for Brush Brush, who is also being stalked by the Cavity Goon and Sweetie. It's like that Sesame Street movie Follow That Bird, only less dramatic. <laughs> okay, except that part. That that actually is still a little freaky. Despite successfully capturing Brush Brush and almost Timmy himself, the villain's plans are ultimately thwarted, and they are forced to make an exit that is undignified even for them. You haven't seen the last of me! <laughs> um... Bye. Episode 6, Spooky Tooth. Okay, I love the title of this one. It's apparently named after a British band that was active from the mid-60s to the mid-70s, which I only learned while making this video, so uh, I learned something. Yay, yay, Timmy. In this Halloween-themed romp, Timmy and Brush Brush are getting ready for a costume party when they are invited by Bubbles to explore a nearby pyramid. Yeah, they actually get there by foot and everything, and this supposedly isn't a fantasy sequence. Inside the pyramid, they meet a lost mummy child named Mumfred and help him navigate his way back to his parents. Along the way, they run into a joke-telling spider, some magic books, and a pharaoh that basically does the Steve Martin King Tut bit. What this episode lacked in plot, it at least made up for in its weirdness. This was actually the first Timmy VHS I saw as a kid, and I wish I had more to say about it, but... I don't! Next episode! Episode 7, The Brush and the Stone Timmy is psyched to go to the fair, but ends up coming down with a case of the itchy polka dots. Luckily, all he needs to cure it is bed rest and a good story, courtesy of Mr. Wisdom. The story in question is a medieval tale about Squire Timmy being set off into the mysterious and weirdly named Not-So-Sure-It's-A-Forest to find a cure for the king's own case of itchy polka dots. Apparently, the story and bed rest routine didn't help his majesty. Timmy is given a noble steed to help him along on the quest, along with probably one of the worst Star Wars references I have ever heard. Oh, and remember, Squire Timmy, use the horse! This is rendered pointless because the horse is scared away a few seconds later, leaving Timmy to continue his quest on foot. He and Bubbles, who plays a Robin Hood-type guardian, encounter the Gingivitis Gang and the fabled Brush in the Stone. Timmy miraculously pulls Brush Brush out of the stone, and Brush Brush miraculously has been able to breathe this whole time. They finally find the cure for the polka dots, a rare kind of berry, but it's guarded by a fire-breathing dragon. Brush Brush reveals that's actually a Scooby-Doo-style trick by who else but the Cavity Goon and Sweetie, who aren't willing to part with the berries. Timmy trades the berries for a couple of puppets, who the Cavity Goon and Sweetie somehow make a decent bit of money on by performing for the Gingivitis Gang, in the villain's only group scene together in the entire series. So it seems like everyone, even the bad guys, have gotten a happy ending this time. And the story seems to have cured Timmy too. Except now Brush Brush is sick, here we go again, lol. Episode 8, An Eye for a Tooth. Sydney gets the chance to shine in this one. See, there's a legacy of sorts in this family of great paper boys. However, Sydney's been having some major eye troubles lately and finds it harder and harder to hit his marks, earning him scorn from his boss and the Gingivitis Gang. As it turns out, he needs glasses, which is all fine and good. But it seems that no one in Flossmore Valley actually makes glasses for Cyclops, which might be something to see a lawyer about. In the end, Timmy and his friends fashion a hat and magnifying glass into a makeshift fix for Sydney, and all is well. Again, there wasn't really much to say about this one, it felt somewhat pedestrian plot-wise compared to the previous episodes with space exploration and stuff. Then I realized that I unironically used the word pedestrian to describe a VHS tape installment from a kid's puppet show from the mid-90s, and I might need to reevaluate my life. I will say this, though, with all his neuroses and his desperate want to please his family, I think Sydney might be my most relatable character, personally. But I can't disappoint my family. But I'll probably lose my job. Huh? I know, I know, I'll get another job. Well, oh, but I, what if I don't? What if I don't? Wow, my girlfriend was right. I'm the nerdy, visually impaired Jewish Cyclops. Episode 9, Rainy Day Adventure. Timmy and Brush Brush are dejected when storming outside. To cheer themselves up, they pretend to be sailors when they get a phone call from a cloud. Just go with it. Apparently, while the clouds were ready for the storm to end, they found the sun, named Sunny, has vanished. As it turns out, the Cavity Goon and Sweetie have done the impossible and ripped the sun from the sky. They plan to throw it in the ocean to ensure rainy, gloomy days forever, along with the uh, extinction of life everywhere. But they get a pretty decent song about it. There's nothing like a cloudy day to uh, make all the smiles go away. 
Cause I can put the sun away on a dirty, dusty little shelf. Why can't they just dunk him underwater now and get it over with? Plot convenience, because Timmy and Brush Brush are on their trail. Timmy manages to snatch Sonny back, but while evading the goon, he accidentally ends up dropping him in the ocean himself, ironically doing the bad guy's dirty work for them. Timmy retrieves Sonny, who's barely clinging to life, and is able to throw the sun back into the sky, restore nature's balance, and probably gain godhood from a superheroic deed. Or maybe he's just content to play frisbee with his friends. Episode 10, Big Mouth Gulch. In the final episode, it's story time at Timmy's house, and Miss Flossie brings her favorite book, which is of course a western. In the story, Sheriff Timmy receives word that the bandit known as Goonie the Kid is heading into town. Goonie, of course played by the Capity Goon, claims that he is reformed and even sports some fancy new duds to prove it. I know that the dapperly dressed gentleman villain in the western has been done before, but all I can think of is Cat R. Wall from Five Goes West when I see him. Which I guess makes Sweetie the tarantula that John Lovitz voiced? Of course, despite the new outfit, Goonie's real plan is to steal Timmy's position as sheriff, which leads to mud raking and framing Timmy for the theft of necklace. Sick of all these little games, Sheriff Timmy finally challenges Goonie to a showdown. Would 1205 be okay for you? Aha! Yes, I think that'll be alright. But in Big Mouth Gulch, they elect their sheriffs based on knowledge rather than gunslinging abilities. Therefore, Goonie finds himself majorly in over his head when he faces Timmy in a spelling bee. Of course, justice prevails. For reasons unknown, the series was discontinued after those 10 episodes, despite promotional ads acting like the show wasn't going away for a while. Perhaps it didn't end up as profitable as they had thought. Maybe the creators want to do something else. Thus, when the shows were aired over a series of two weeks on Nick Jr., slightly edited for time, it ended up being the series' swan song. After that, some puppets like Sidney, Bubbles, and Annette were used on the humorous Puppet Greetings website. An octopus puppet featured on the series was sold on eBay at some point. And finally, puppets like the Gingivitis Gang and the Cavity Goon were used on the Greg the Bunny TV series. Incidentally, Greg the Bunny was a hilarious show with a talented cast and likable characters. But it was on Fox, so it was cancelled after one season. There's truly no justice in the world sometimes. I'm dead, Gil! <laughs> oh. Speaking of no justice, despite the VHS tapes of Timmy being well out of print and given no re-releases, clips of the show often find themselves being taken down from YouTube for copyright reasons. And it's frustrating because the chances of this show ever getting a digital release are slim to none. But I promise you, Universal, if you ever do that, I will buy all ten episodes. Seriously. So, why did I make this video? Was the series that worth a retrospective like this? Well, I'll be honest, and it hurts a little to say... In the grand scheme, probably not. It was your average run-of-the-mill puppet show, but it was my puppet show. Sure, it was no Henson production like Sesame Street or Fraggle Rock, and I'll admit my nostalgia can be blinding, but the show was still special to me, silly and childlike or not. It's just sad to see it falling through the cracks, and I thought that maybe this video would give it the love it deserves. Or needs. Someone's gotta do it. <laughs> so I'll close with this. If any of the cast and crew is watching, and I kind of doubt you are, I just want to thank you on behalf of my five-year-old self. You, you made me happy. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we're together, just me and you. Oh, you are my friend. You're my very best friend.